Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities needed it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. Today, I talked with Shelby County, Tennessee School Board member, Shalia Harris. Shalia was elected to the board in 2020. Since her election, she's been on the front lines of the fight to keep our children safe during the pandemic, while working to address the digital divide, kids experiencing homelessness, and improving equity in Shelby County schools. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Shelby County School Board member, Shalia Harris, welcome to An Honorable Profession. It is wonderful to be speaking with you today. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. I got to start by asking, you took this position in August of last year in the midst of a pandemic, probably the most difficult time in history to be on a school board. Right. (laughs) Tell me about your decision to serve and what the last year has been like for you. So difficult is such a nice word um, (laughs) to use. (laughs) Um, It has been very interesting. There have been, you know, some days better than others. However, I try to keep in the front of me, you know, my why. I decided to run. One, I'm a former educator, and I believe that we need to have educators on our school board, local school boards. So that was one thing. Another reason is I looked around my community where I was raised, and I did not see representation that represented me from state senator, state representative, uh, county commission, city council, and to the school board, it was all middle-aged white males. And that did not look like me. It did not look like the community as it is now. So that was another reason I decided to run. And just like I said, with, with my background in education, I felt like the teacher voice was missing on the board. So I'm the second educator now sitting on the school board. And it's just very It's very interesting just to kind of take a step back and see how everything works, especially on the operations side of it, Uh, of course, academics. But coming in last year, just in the midst of this very real pandemic that we are still in, I had to hit the ground running. I really didn't have time to take a breath. You know, the the election was one night. The the next Monday, I'm I'm up reading, <laughs> reading documents and, and and figuring out which committee I'm going to be on. Trying to see where our our areas of refinement are as a district. How how can I plug in my strengths into those areas? So I have not had a time to take a deep breath. And I will say that since August 6, 2020, until today, I have not had time to to take a deep breath. But I always think back to my why. Like I'm here for our children. I'm here for our educators and just keeping that right in front of me. So it's difficult is a very nice word. <laughs> um, it, it has been, it, it's been quite the experience, but I've committed to four years in this seat. I do plan to finish my term and do the things that I said I'm going to do. Difficult is the, it's a replacement. I think for many of us elected officials of a lot of four letter words when, uh, when we're in private right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, about, right. about what the last year has been like. I have so many questions about what you've been pursuing in your year, and you've been extremely active on a number of initiatives. But first, I want to talk about, you know, looking around, as you said, and not seeing people who look like you in representative positions. How did you mobilize a campaign to bring more diversity to the board? And were there challenges with that? And uh, and what do you say to the people who who may be in a similar position and looking at their elected bodies and saying, this, this doesn't look like me or my community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it was difficult. I was going up against a very strong incumbent. There are a few other people in the race as well, which, which made it very heavy. <laughs> and so I kind of had to fight through a lot of noise just to make it up to the top. The important part 
for me is consistency during the campaign, just being consistent, even on days where it's like, okay, nobody's even looking at my post. I'm trying to push out all this content with the campaign and these pictures and all this stuff and nobody's looking at it, but just being consistent. And like I said before, continuing to keep that why in front of me. And I knew if I never, if I didn't step out, then I would never do it. And I kind of put the weight on myself. Well, if I don't do it, who else will? If I don't take, you know, this, this leap or this step of faith and do it, nobody else will do it. So I just took on that responsibility personally and let that be my driver. Like I have to make sure that the children in this district, the children in, in Memphis and Shelby County have what they need. I do believe in equity and access have to go hand in hand. So how do I live this out? Well, the only option that I had was school board. That was the, that was the place where I knew that one, I have the background to have impact, and I knew that I can really change things. And so I just went for it. I put all fear aside, and I just went for it. Like I said, if I did not step out, I knew I was not going to do it. So just go for it. I mean, literally, just go for it. If I can give anybody any advice on, you know, should you run or, or anything, just go for it. As long as you have your heart in the right place and your intentions are pure, do it. Just do it. Going back to the campaign, was there anything that surprised you? I mean, you, you work uh, in the private sector, and so the public mm-hmm. sector is a, is a whole different animal. But as you step out, how did you feel about the experience? Um, I didn't know that so much of myself would be revealed. It's, it's almost like my whole life had to become an open book. So I did not realize how much of that would happen. But on the other side, I didn't know how much support I would get. I was very shocked at just the magnitude of support. Just people that I had never seen, never talked to before, but, you know, maybe knew of. They were donating, you know, hundreds of dollars to the campaign. I was getting phone calls of support. That was really unexpected. Like, I knew I would get a little bit, you know, but I don't have name recognition here in Memphis. I didn't have, you know the huge platform. I wasn't appointed. I didn't come in on, you know, unopposed or anything like that. I literally had to work my butt off every single day. And I was just shocked by the amount of support that I got. That's a good story to hear. Yeah. And you never know you're going to get that support unless you put yourself out there, uh, which is is critical, as you said. So let's talk about, you you said you got to run because you got to know your why. And um, mm-hmm. you've, you've been pushing a number of a, a, uh, initiatives on both before the board and on the board, one around helping youth and young adults experiencing homelessness. Can you talk mm-hmm. about the specific ways to engage that population and what, what a school district can do to make sure it serves all kids? Yeah. So I started a a nonprofit organization almost six years ago, Living Grace. And the focus is to support students that are experiencing different levels of homelessness in Grace K through 12. When I was in the classroom, I had a student that was homeless and I had no idea. I just so happened to pay attention to his behavior change and how his living situation came into the classroom with him. So what started as just a simple drawer in my desk with toiletries and a few school supplies, that became a whole ministry. You know, if I, I'm, I'm thinking this one child in my class is homeless, how many other kids in a city like Memphis are going through the same thing? And how are they impacted within the four walls of the classroom? So externally, I was able to build up this continuum of care with local community organizations to help donate supplies to our students. I was able to adopt a few, or we were able to adopt a few schools and specifically target those students with housing insecurity. When you think about it, even as an adult, your security comes from your home, the place that you, a place where you lay your head. Say you did not have that, even as an adult, how that would impact your day to day. And so just thinking through that lens for our students, it's just one of those external barriers that can be eliminated. What can we do to provide this child with everything that they need so that when they walk into the classroom, they're successful academically and they don't have to worry about all those adult issues when they leave. So that's one thing that we started a few years ago. Uh, Now on the board, really transitioning those same responsibilities, but more of a uh, policy perspective. Um, that's one of the responsibilities of school board members is to create impact and implement policies. 
So I worked with this organization out of D.C. that I'd known for a few years, Schoolhouse Connection, and told them, you know, I, I want to do some work around McKinney Vento. That's one of the things that I promised in my campaign. It's one of the things I'm very passionate about. And I know that a lot of things don't move without policy in place. So what can we do around McKinney Vento? So they work with me on the language of an accountability framework, which as of now, no other local school district in the country has a McKinney-Vento accountability framework. Shelby County Schools is the first and hopefully not the last one to implement this. And basically what it does, it, it outlines how we're serving our students with housing insecurity. How many do we have? What are our areas of refinement? You know, how are we spending our federal dollars, our local dollars to support these students before there was nothing there? at all. And so, you know, it just kind of went through. But now we have really a spotlight on it, especially now during COVID, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs. And in reality, a lot of people are just one paycheck away from being homeless. That is our reality in this country. And so we've seen a significant increase of students that fall under this law. And so we're just taking another step of accountability as a district. Um, That was my first resolution um, that I was able to prevent, uh, present on the school board. Super proud of that. Uh, We have a whole lot of work, more work to go, but first resolution got it passed. And so (laughs) that's, that was a win, a huge win, of course, with the support of a lot of folks, but we were able to get that done. And now we're we're seeing it in, in practice. And, and and first of all, congratulations and amazing work. And I know it's only been Thank you. a short time, but but how have you seen the the organization change as a result of of your efforts and creating this accountability? The organization as in your, your, organization? your school district. Yeah. So I, I think that it, it moves the, the needle in one spot. We have over 100,000 students. Uh, We do have the largest district in Tennessee. And so there's so many areas that need work. I mean, granted, we are doing some great things in a lot of areas, but there's so many areas where we need work. This was just a small needle in the right direction in one area. And and I just we take it one day at a time, one day at a time. What impact can we do today? Let's own that. And then let's go into the next day. So it, it was huge based on the number of students that we have that are protected under McKinney now, because like I said before, that number has increased significantly this year, but it was definitely a huge step in the right direction. That's good. And we look forward to learning more as, as you, you know, blaze a trail in this area. Hopefully we can learn lessons and apply them in districts ac- across the country because it's a problem that mm-hmm. impacts every community uh, in the United right. States. And, and as you mentioned, it's only getting more challenging uh, as this pandemic continues on. Right, right. I want to talk about another initiative that you've uh, launched, sort of on a, the different end of the spectrum, which is to, uh, the Inventor STEM conference that provides a space for mm-hmm. minority high school girls to connect and uh, with careers and interests in science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, talk a little mm-hmm. bit about that and talk about how you bring that, those values and that commitment to equity into your work in the, in the school district. So the Inventor Conference started as just a a simple idea about three years ago. Representation is so important. I believe if our girls, especially our minority girls, can see it and touch it and speak to it, then they can do it. And we know the numbers uh, of minority women in STEM is low right now. And so taking that responsibility then as a community member, what can I do to bring more young girls into contact with these women here locally? Because it's one thing to get, you know, so-and-so from New York or D.C. or what have you and have them come in. But for the girls to see someone that looks like them, that lives right here in Memphis doing amazing work in STEM, I mean, that it, it, it was it was amazing. I, I couldn't even the first conference that we had uh, was, of course, you know, in person. But I, I, the look on the girls' faces when they walked in and we had over 20 women that took a part of their day to spend with teenagers <laughs> and to talk to them about, you know, here are my very real challenges as a minority woman. But here on the other side, here are the advantages of that. And just connecting them, just putting them in the same room, in the same space, at the same table with these amazing women. I mean, the, the impact of that, the lasting impact of that. I mean, people are still talking about it. Of course, we couldn't do it this year, but right before everything shut down last year, 
uh, we were able to do it uh, again. And same experience. We had even more ladies to come in, even more sessions that we were able to offer. But just hands-on, you know, in-person connections, networking, conversations with women who look like the girls doing great work in STEM. I do plan to continue that same momentum. Um, I'll add on a few more partners this year with my role with Verizon and then also with the school board, just combining all that good stuff and providing our students with access. Equity is one thing, but if you cannot get to what we're talking about, if you cannot get to the resources, if you're not able to be in the room with it, then all of our work is in vain. So when I say equity and access, I mean having it right in front of you and making sure that our students can actually touch it. So I do plan to continue that with our STEM conference. And how do you find, I mean, there's a lot of talk about equity and access, but then it gets it mm-hmm. gets challenging when the rubber meets the road. Um, how right. are you finding those conversations in your district as you try to, to move that agenda forward? It depends on where you are. The conversation can change. Um, you can literally drive from one district in the school to, you know, another, and it's like night and day. So I, first, identifying the problem. You can go from one side of town to the other, and it's literally night and day. So when I say equity and access, like, yeah, we have the resources. Yeah, we have the funding to provide everything. But if every child is not touching it, then we have to continue the work. But it just depends on where you are. You know, access looks differently. Success looks differently. A successful school looks differently per district. So those are the type of conversations I'm having. How how can we position ourselves and shift our Uh, perspective and responsibilities to make sure that every single child, despite what district or zip code that they're in, touches the same thing. So like I said, the the conversation is different per neighborhood, per community that you're in in Memphis, but it's very difficult to have sometimes, especially the way that Memphis is set up. So Shelby County Schools is the largest school district in the city, but you also have municipalities. So these are very small uh, school districts that have broken off from the greater district basically the suburban districts, I consider them to be. And so if those students, which are still children in Memphis, if those students have access to something, why can't our students in Shelby County Schools have the same thing? I think that's the biggest contrast that you can visibly see uh, when you're here. But we have uh, several districts in one city, and we have this expectation on all of our children to perform at the same level, but we're not giving them the same tools to do that. And their life the problem. Their life the elephant in the room that we're trying to trying to attack at the same time. But I think we're just having different conversations in different directions about it. If that makes sense, it does. And it's well, it makes sense uh, as you explain it. It may it doesn't necessarily make sense for the kind of society or country we want to have our school right, districts right. so fragmented uh, and such right. different resources. I mean, I, I guess that's one of my questions. Is you know. You're there, you're trying to make change, but the system feels so broken or, or mm-hmm. fractured. Mm-hmm. How do you maintain the, the hope and the, you know, the effort to continue to, to, to try to make a difference? It's very difficult. It's very difficult when you, when you see the different districts, you see the different neighborhoods. It's heartbreaking. And it's almost like I, I walk around with this, this weight on my chest, just being on the school board and knowing the responsibility that I have and having such a strong desire to change, you know, a system that has been around forever. It's very difficult. But what I hold on to is what I can do on this day. When I say take every day to, at a time, it's literally waking up saying, OK, on today, on Monday, October the 18th, what can I do? What can I do towards uh, my goal? What can I do towards impacting a child or a teacher or whomever today? I think that keeps me sane. It keeps me balanced uh, of not trying to look too far ahead, not focusing so much on the past, but focusing on this day that I'm given, this day that I woke up, that I am breathing. What can I do today? And owning that, owning the lanes that I'm in, staying within my circle of competency where I can be most impactful and effective. And focusing on this day, on this Monday, what have I done to impact a child? That's what gets me through. I, 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 yeah, I mean, it's in these days that keeping that focus is so essential. Otherwise, you're Mm going to 
burn out or, or give up. I want to talk yeah. a little bit. These problems that you're raising, whether it's kids experiencing homelessness or creating equity in science and math or distribution of resources, these are all really hard problems to solve when everyone's being civil and thoughtful uh, in the conversation. Mm-hmm. But we've watched school districts come under attack over the course of the last year around COVID and around the polarization. How are you seeing the the conversation, uh, the process around these issues uh, in your community? Honestly, I don't think in, in Shelby County schools that we have it as bad as some of these other districts, even in Tennessee, especially when you see things on the news about, you know, community members coming to board meetings and protesting and all that. We get a, a small piece of that, but it's not as bad as you see on a grand scale and very thankful for that. I mean, we have our, you know, one or two folks that might pop up every now and then. Uh, We might get a few emails about certain things, especially if it's a controversial item on one of our um, uh, agendas for a board meeting, but we don't get it as bad as, as we see a lot of these other districts get it. And so I'm just going to fingers crossed and knock on wood on that, that we don't run into those issues. But our biggest thing is keeping our children safe. And being very vocal about that, being very intentional and not backing down. You know, our our demographic of Shelby County Schools might be a little different from other districts across the state, from other districts across the country. And so we have to do what works best for children in Memphis and really standing firm to that. I think that we've been doing a, a pretty decent job at that so far. And in the context of COVID and masks and vaccines, you've been very mm-hmm. clear and an outspoken advocate on what your kids need to be safe, but you're in a red state uh, that hasn't always uh, taken the same approach. Can you talk a right. little bit about what the last year has been like as you're trying to navigate the, the politics of COVID, keep your kids safe and deal with a state that that may may have a different approach to these uh, issues than, than your, your district will? It's like a constant tug of war. It's like every day, you know, there's there's always going to be a push and a pull. We just want to make sure that we are pushing and pulling in the right direction. And I'm always going to go back to, you know, what's best for our kids? What's best for Shelby County Schools? And let's stick to that and let's fight for it, no matter who it is, whether it's the governor, whether it's the senator, you know, someone locally, whomever it is, we're going to fight for what's best for our children the best way that we know how to do that. We've seen quite a bit in the past year, and, and this is nothing new. This whole tug of war and, you know, back and forth with Shelby County Schools and the state, that's nothing new. But, of course, you know, this past year has been very unique. But we're at the end of the day, we're going to do what's right for our kids. If that is, you know, requiring all of our students and teachers to wear masks, then that's what we're going to do. We've gotten local support from our health department director here. Uh, we've gotten support uh, from, from our state legislators. We're going to do what's best for the children right here in Memphis. And we're just going to push hard on it. We're not going to let up on it. But like I said, it's just a constant tug of war and it doesn't have to be this way whatsoever. I think a lot of things can be solved with just a simple conversation, you know, coming to some type of, you know, equal ground. Okay, this is what we need here. So as a leader, you're going to have to adapt and adjust. You cannot treat every single district, even in the same state, the same. But like I said, tug of war, tug of war every single day, but we're not going to back down at all. Whatever is best for the children here in Memphis, that's what we're going to do. I like that. I like that metaphor of a tug of war. You're just going to like part Mm -hmm. of the job is to hold on to that rope as tight as you can. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Not get it. Not let it get pulled. So your day job, I mean, so when we talk about all these things, we're talking about something you're doing on top of a very intense and important day (laughs) job working for Verizon. And um, and there are times when that hat overlaps as you're trying to think about, you know, especially as COVID has shown the digital divide Mm -hmm. in this country. And so can you talk a little bit about, you know, and potentially where from both your both hats, perspectives, what we can do to bridge that divide and help our students be connected and successful. So within my role with Verizon, I'm a government affairs manager, really have the whole state. But since I'm here in Memphis, of course, my connections are a little bit tighter here. But the focus is digital inclusion. How do we build 
uh, local relationships to, you know, further our bills so that every community has access to broadband, high speed Internet, all of that. So that's my actual day job. That is what I do for at least 40 hours a week. But still, I always have my school board responsibilities rotating in the back of my head. OK, if I'm doing this, you know, in my Verizon space, how can this potentially within compliance roll over into, you know, addressing the digital divide on the school board? And I basically take the knowledge and the understanding that I have with my job and I use that to inform my colleagues, informing them on, hey, you know, this is what digital equity really is. This is why it's a problem here in Memphis. And even having conversations with our other local officials, our mayors, our county commissioners, city council members, this is where the problem is. And in order for us to move forward together, really moving forward together, we need to do A, B, and C. And that can be either in my Verizon role or my school board role. They all just kind of, it all meshes together because at the end of the day, I'm serving people. Whether you are an adult in, in, you know, in, in the workforce or whether you're a child or an educator, I'm serving people every single day. So they don't overlap often, but when they do, I try to present the facts, what I know, what will work and what could be most impactful. And the, the pandemic exposed just how much of a digital divide uh, we have in this country uh, and access to, mm-hmm. do you see post pandemic that, you know, there's always in a crisis, there's an effort to change things. And sometimes when the crisis goes away, the, the impetus to get something done goes away. And sometimes the crisis mm-hmm. uh, forces us to, to engage in a reckoning. Do you think that, that where, where do you think the country's headed or at least your state's headed in terms of ensuring access to everyone? I think that locally, but even, you know, nationally, we're having a different conversation on broadband. We're having a different conversation on Wi-Fi and access and what that really looks like and kind of pulling back the layers on, well, where are we now? And what are those A, B, and C steps that we need to take so that we don't run into what we experienced this past year? No one knew that all the schools were shut down. No one knew that the whole world was shut down. And so based on what we learned, you know, moving forward, we cannot go back to the same. In Shelby County, every child has a laptop or an iPad. And a lot of school districts districts across the country did the same thing. So now that we're at one-to-one learning in the majority of our districts, how are we going to be innovative moving forward? We cannot go back to the, the old school, you know, students in different roles, just listen to a teacher lecture. That is not the way our children learn right now. And I think that this, this pandemic really, it really pushed an awakening for education. You know, this, what we've been doing, it doesn't work. It just does not work. And it didn't work for every child anyway. So now that we have this unique opportunity to have a hard shift, to have this paradigm shift, how are we going to move forward? Like the charge is really on us. How do we move forward based on what was very clear and very evident to everyone at the same time, which made it super unique? How are we going to move forward? And that's a conversation for everybody. It doesn't just rely on the local school board. That's every local official. That's every community organization, whether it's nonprofit or the for-profit sector. Our children are, are our responsibility. That's everyone's responsibility. If you look at any thriving city, it's a direct correlation to a thriving local um, education system. When the kids are doing well, the whole community thrives. And I feel like now is the time for us to really be aware of that and make that hard shift with no excuses. And do you feel like as a school board member, you have a number of constituencies, right? You have administrators, you Mm -hmm. have teachers, you have parents, you have the students themselves. Mm -hmm. Are, are, Are they engaging in that conversation and and what are they telling you about about what they need and where where this is all headed so everyone has voiced everyone has voiced this from our students which i have intentionally chosen about 10 students from district 5 because i wanted direct you know don't sugarcoat it give me good feedback on what's really going on in your school where do you really need support just give it to me cut and dry. And my students are telling me that, you know, the devices are okay, but, you know, we really need A, B, and C. And the parents are having issues with, 
you know, uh, access to Wi-Fi at home. And the teachers are having, you know, some difficulty with tech support at school. And so it's, it's different conversations about the same thing. And I'm really trying to figure out how, how can I support in each, for each group, basically. And it's been very difficult because no one has the absolute right answer. None of us has been in this situation before. The thing is, everyone is talking about the same thing right now. There's a lack of access. There's clear disparities right now. So how are we addressing this as a community? So, yeah, the, it, it, everyone's talking about it. Everyone's talking about broadband and Wi-Fi and all of that. I'm more into the action side of it. Yes, we do know it's an issue. You know, yeah, a, a, it's, clear, it's a clear issue. But how do we fix it? Like, I don't want to still talk about Wi-Fi five years from now and we're in the same situation. Like, what have we done to fix it? It's just like poverty. We know what poverty is. We don't need panels and conferences and, and chats about poverty. Just go feed the children. Make sure that the parents have, well, the families have livable jobs. Make sure they have transportation to get to those jobs. Like, it's very simple solutions. I'm just tired of us talking about it. And I don't go on about that all day. Just I, I'm more interested in our action based on what we know is an issue, which is access right now. Where's the action behind it? So I got to ask, because the school district has a has a mandate to provide the, the educational piece of, of some of those equations that the actions that you just mentioned, but mm-hmm. the other components are, are at different levels of government. Do you see yourself staying at the school board level or are, are you thinking about other offices that may impact your, your why, your students, but from different, from different angles? So here's the tricky part of this. I do plan to stay in my seat full term unless something drastically changes. But as far as moving up or out or to another position, based on my role with Verizon, I kind of can't <laughs> um, because I'm, I'm a registered lobbyist and I'm a local lobbyist and I'm a state level lobbyist. So I can't do any other uh, local positions and I can't do any other uh, state positions. So literally the only thing that I can do right now, because I do not lobby school board members. And so this is my lane. Unless my position changes with Verizon, which it could, I kind of have to stick with school board, which I don't mind. I like it. I love it. But I'm, I'm very, my, my situation is a little unique. So I'm just going to take it day by day and we'll see what happens. That is the best answer <laughs> I can give. I tell you what, I've asked that a lot of a lot of elected officials, and that was the most direct and clear answer I think I've ever gotten on this show. Perfect. So uh, I appreciate that, that you're just like laying it out all out there. <laughs> right, uh, right, right. The, the last thing I want to talk to you about is like when I was reading articles about you and your efforts, the one that just like, you know, struck a chord in my heart that I thought would, would be a good way to end is uh, you helped get a reading garden for an elementary school. Can you just oh, tell yes. me a little bit about uh, what that was and and what reading gardens do? It just sounds, it just sounded like what we all need in this difficult time mm-hmm. is a garden to go out and read. <laughs> so I thought I'd, so I thought I'd wrap, was, wrap it up with that. It was so fun. First of all, it, it was fun. So our focus as a district is literacy. Too many of our children are not on grade level reading by third grade. And we know that that's kind of the marker. If if you're not on track by third grade, you know, you'll be behind until you graduate, if you do. So literacy is is our focus right now. And just thinking about how can we be innovative with our students? You know, we don't want reading to be a chore. We want them to have fun with it. We want them to be excited about it. And so I went to one of the schools in my district, uh, Chimney Rock Elementary. The landscape of the school, just where it kind of sits on the property, is beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful. It just needed a little TLC. And so we took a portion of uh, the property on the school. I went to Lowe's, which I feel like I go to Lowe's every single day because I, I'm, I'm working on my green thumb. It's really, really light green right now. But I'm trying to get a dark green for the end of the year. So this was fun for me all around. So I went to Lowe's, got a ton of flowers. We were able to get one of our local landscapers who actually, they're uh, from uh, District 5. They have a student that go or a child that goes to that school, which I didn't even know. It just turned out that way. They came out and cleared the land for us. They laid out the mulch and everything. They kind of gave us the 
the outline of the flower beds. I mean, they did all the heavy lifting. We just came in and played in dirt and planted some really nice flowers. Uh, we have some benches out there. We had this huge ribbon cutting. The news came out. It was just beautiful. But I felt like our students deserved that. You know, it, it, with, with this whole social distancing and wearing your mask and all that, which we need, the children need a break. They need something fun. We cannot go back to what we used to do, you know, hours at a time in the same seat all day, you know, hearing the same messages. Give the children a break. Give them something fun to do. Let them go outside. Let them explore. Let them look at the different flowers. I mean, we had families come that Saturday. We had members of the football team at the high school down the street. They came and volunteered. I mean, it was, it was just, um, it was beautiful. I mean, the whole experience from beginning to end was just beautiful. We had all these folks come out to support. We got a lot of donations in. Um, of course, the school principal was there. She was down in the dirt as well. It was just, it was just a beautiful experience. I just wanted our children to have something. I, I really want to do this at every single school, but just taking one bite at a time, just wanted our students to have something beautiful because they deserve that and give them space to learn. Give them an innovative space to learn that they can make their own because they deserve it. That's enough to keep you going through all the challenges. Right. To keep right. me going. <laughs> I loved it. I, and I'm trying not to get emotional about it because I'm just thinking back on the children's faces. I had one student come up. She said, well, did you do this for us? I said, well, yeah, baby, you deserve it. You deserve to have something beautiful. You deserve to have this, you know, this outdoor space. I even got books donated, some brand new books donated for them. And so it just, it, it was just a beautiful experience. And that, like you said, that kept that keeps me going. Just thinking about those moments of impact, that's what keeps me going. Because our kids deserve it. That keeps me going. That story, I, yes. I'm getting emotional now yes. just thinking about it. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, I love well, it. I love it. Well, I want to thank you for uh, being on today. It's wonderful. Uh, you're part of the new class at the New Deal. And it's wonderful yes. to have you in the program and the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. We are, uh, we're so grateful and keep, keep it going and keep serving up, uh, as a model on policy and, and reading gardens, uh, for all of us. I uh, will. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to an honorable profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Row Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast. Mm-hmm.